This morning, the, the message title is The Armament Rea- Reality. Next Sunday, guess what the message will be? The Resurrection Reality. As we look at the fact that he has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and there have been witnesses that verify his resurrection. Well, the Bible teaches from beginning to end the existence of an invisible world. The spirit world. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, we can see it from angels and demons and yet a world that um, it is not just a world where we have the physical that we see. The Bible shows us that there is this invisible world and we tend to focus on only what we can see with our senses, the things we can taste, touch, smell, hear. But the invisible world of the Spirit is just as real, and that's what this series is all about. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for the unction of the Spirit of God, the anointing of the Lord. I thank you for the Spirit in me that is welling up to proclaim this word that you've given me. I thank you, O God, Lord, that you, O God, are not only anointing me, but you're anointing all of us to hear what the Spirit has to say to us to us. I thank you, O oh God, Lord, for in this moment it will be transformational, that your word will not return void, that you will transform us, change us, and give us the tools, O oh God, to stand against the enemy and see victory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, go to Ephesians chapter 6. We've just talked about verses 10 and 11. We want to take a look at verse um, 14, and we're going to go 14 through 18. I will refer back to verse 12 a little bit as well. So follow along with me. The Bible says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert And always keep on praying for all the saints. There is good news for us this morning. It is good news in this battle against the forces of good and evil. The good news is, is that God has not left us defenseless. He has provided an armament for us to protect us as to well, as well as give us victory in this battle. That's the reason that the word says to us, the armor of God is so that we can, first of all, stand against the evil in this battle. Look at verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Now, someone once said, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you ought to look and find why it, what it's there for. It's referring to something previous. And the reference is, is what our fight is all about. You know, God has provided this armament to stand against something, but what? Verse 12 that we read last week talks about the fact that the battle is not, say that word with me, not against flesh and blood. But what does that mean? What does it mean that the battle is not against flesh and blood? You know, Obviously, the people of that day were experiencing persecution. Paul's imprisoned at times. Paul is stoned and left dead on one occasion. Paul is is beat with 39 lashes at one time. And, And people did this to him. But Paul is trying to draw our attention to that it's not the people... 
It is the spirit of the world that is at work in those folks. Paul is telling us how foolish it is to fight flesh and blood when the real enemy is merely using flesh and blood to obstruct the Lord's work. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but whether it's God or whether it's Satan, they need a vessel to work through. You see, for God to bring about his kingdom, for God to bring our ones to Christ, he needs somebody that's willing to be his vessel, willing to tell them about Jesus, willing to, to uh, invite them, willing. God needs a vessel to work through to bring his kingdom about. That's why he chose 12. And all those 12, he said, go preach. Because he needs vessels to work through. The enemy is the same way. He needs a vessel to work through, but it's the enemy that is doing the work. And, and, and we see here that this truth, that it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual wickedness, against the prince of the power of the air. Think with me for a moment on these events that come up to the Easter week and the Resurrection Sunday. Many things go on. You have one of the events where Jesus and the disciples meet in the upper room. Jesus reveals to them that someone's going to betray him. They're all wondering who it is so much so that they keep, is it me, Lord? Is it, is it I? And then after they celebrate Passover together, it says they sang a hymn and they went out and they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. The event that I want us to focus on is, is as Jesus and the disciples are praying, all of a sudden there's torches that begin to blaze up in the night as they're there in the Mount of Olives praying, and there's men coming with swords and clubs, and they're coming to arrest Jesus. And Peter, what does he do? He takes his sword out, and I tell you, Peter must not have been a very good swordsman because I doubt whether he was aiming for that servants of the high priest his ear, but he lobs the ear off. Jesus tells him to put away his sword. Why? Because he doesn't say this there, but it's, you can see it. He's not, they're not fighting against flesh and blood. Jesus realizes that the forces behind this are Satan himself. And then there's Jesus in the wilderness when he's tempted. More about that in a moment. There's Moses when he recognizes that his people are in bondage and he sees one of his fellow Israelites being beaten. He, he tries to bring liberation by killing the Egyptian. And that solved little of nothing. And Moses learns that the real fight is a spiritual fly, a fight if the people are to be delivered. It's going to take the miraculous working of Almighty God to move the greatest nation uh, on the planet at that time, to change the hearts of people, because it was the prince of the power of the air at work. Paul wasn't saying that there weren't people who were persecuting and wanting to destroy, but he was saying the main source of the hatred and the evil and the wickedness was the spiritual conflict that is going on from the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see, we are to stand with this armament, not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces, against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. God is saying that the real battle is the spiritual arena. It is a battle in the unseen realms, and that's why prayer is so important, my friends. It is a battle against good and evil, against righteousness and wickedness. Now, I shared with you uh, a definition last week. I want to reiterate it this morning. And, and the definition about sin. Do you remember I said that sin is an invisible force? Say that with me. Just those words to begin with. Sin is an invisible force. I want everybody to say it one more time. Sin is an invisible force. 
Sin is an invisible force that emanates from the person of Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. And it impacts upon the mind to stimulate the brain to think thoughts, urges, fantasies, and ideas in terms of life choices which detract from and eventually destroy one's divine potential. Dr. Richard Dobbins wrote that. But Jesus said it this way. He's just illustrated to us in ways that we understand. Jesus said, the thief has come but for to kill, steal, and destroy. And the way that he does that, he emanates his his power to make our minds think in life choices that detract from and eventually destroy us. So God gives us this armament to stand against, but not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. Secondly, see, God has given us this armament because of Satan and sin, and he wants to provide his followers with armament to withstand sin and Satan's attacks. Now, I'm not going to read all of those verses again, but this is verses, um, chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, and, and we're going to look at this armament individually here. But before we do that, hear me, it is critically urgent that we recognize that although we have become Christ followers, although we have become born-again persons, we are still in a process of transformation. We are being transformed like him. And someday we will be like him. But until that process is completed, and I don't think it's completed until we go home to be with the Lord, the enemy is still raging against us. That's why you need this armament. So let's look at these parts and keep in mind, it is the armor of God, the Bible says. He has provided you and I armor for the battles that we face against the enemy. First of all, he says, Paul says, put on the belt of truth. Now, in the ancient world, everything, as Paul was looking at perhaps a Roman soldier who was guarding him as he was in prison, and he looked at that, and God gave him this illustrated sermon. He talked about putting on a belt of truth, and in this ancient world, this belt kept everything in place, and usually it was pretty wide. I don't think... Um, that it was as wide as the WW World Wrestling Belt. I mean, that thing's massive, isn't it? And that buckle. I guess I don't have very many wrestling fans in here. I didn't get much reaction. But it was pretty wide. And the process of it was not only tying all of the armor together, but it was also to protect the, the gut and the kidney. It provided protection there. You know, um, the, we, we often use metaphors that when, when something gets to us, it, we talk about it, it got us in our gut, you know. It, it went to the core of our being. It just, you know, um, and, and so the truth, the belt of truth, protects us so that we are not vulnerable and exposed to the lies of Satan. Jesus said that Satan is the father of what? He's the father of lies. And he said, there isn't any truth in him. Now, he will twist the truth. We've seen that. We saw that in the Word of God. And Satan is a deceiver, and we can, see that through, we can see through his deception only when we have on the belt of truth. Because when we have the truth, we can compare what is being said to the truth and know what is true. And that is the Word of God. Next, I want you to see that the Bible says that we're to put on this breastplate of righteousness. 
Now, we live in a day where, where people that are first responders often wear, will wear bulletproof Kevlar, Kevlar vests. And, but the ancient breastplates had the same goal of the vests that we see today. The goal was to protect the lungs and the heart as well as those other vital or organs that are up here in the chest. And make no mistake, your and my heart must be protected. Because we live in a tangible world, you know, uh, in our eye gate and, 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 and all that, we, mu I, we must have our heart protected. The Word says that our heart is the wellspring of life and we must guard it. So I see this breastplate of righteousness being twofold. First of all, we thank God for the fact, as we've taken of communion today, that this breastplate of righteousness is the imputed righteousness of Christ to us. Let me share this text, this scripture with you. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, it was so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so this breastplate, a part of this is, is, is that my heart and, and, and that is protected by the righteousness that comes through Christ. But I also want you to see that this breastplate, a second part of it, is the empowered righteousness. He empowers us to do right, to live right, that, that he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. The empowered righteousness. When I get to that place and, and sin is impacting my mind, trying to get me to think in life choices that will detract from my divine potential, the Holy Spirit is there in that moment and saying, here's the other way. Go this way. This is the way out, the way over, the way around this thing. That's the promise of God. And that's the armament of God. Then the apostle says that we need to have our feet fitted, as he's talking about this armament that God provides, fitted with readiness. Now I'm told that the Greek here is literally having underbound the feet. <laughs> Let me ask you a silly question this morning. How many of you grew up in a house where there were Legos. Can I see your hand? You grew up in a house where there are Legos. Maybe, maybe there are still Legos in your house. You know, either your brother or your sister or your kids, Legos in the house. Did you ever get up in the middle of the night and not turn on the lights and be barefooted and step on those? I see some, some heads, yeah. Step on those Legos. Painful thing. The corners, the sharp corners on those Legos. It took everything to keep my religion when I stepped on one of those. If you've done that, you understand the picture here that is being given when the Greek talks about the fact of having an underbound or protected feet. Now there's another thing about this that, that just strikes me. Their feet fitted with rem uh, readiness is reminiscent of what God said to the Israelites at the time of the first Passover. He said, I want you to, he, he gave them all the directions on how they were to celebrate the first Passover. Not only did he tell them that, he said, when you celebrate the Passover, have your feet shod, let me get this right, have your feet shod and ready for the journey. That's exactly what 
the apostle is telling us here is that our feet need to be protected for the journey. There are some times that our journey gets treacherous. There are some times when there are some spiritual Legos that are out there that when we step on them, they're incredibly painful. And Paul is saying, make sure that your feet are ready for the journey that you face and that they're shod with the gospel of peace. I want to tell you today, we can walk through the dangers, the toils, and the snares undergirded with God's peace when our feet are shod with the armament that God provided. Finally, he talk, not finally, a couple more. He finally, he talks about this, this shield of faith that Fends off arrows, spears, swords, any weapon the enemy launches at us. You know, um, the, the shield, they could stand behind it, they could raise it up, and, and it, it, Satan is the source of many different poisonous arrows that are launched at us. I think some of the most poisonous arrows that he fires at us are unbelief and doubt. He will try to get you to doubt God's goodness, God's blessing, God's direction, and even the Word of God. Remember, it was, it was revealed to us in the very beginning when he created Adam and Eve, and he came to deceive Eve. One of the things that he says to her as he gets to appeal to her with this temptation, did God really say that? She didn't raise the shield of faith but acquiesced and doubted. You see, with the shield of faith, when we're able to raise the shield of faith, those deadly arrows of doubt and fear can be deflected. Paul not only talks about this armament of the shield of faith, he also talks about the helmet of salvation. Now, this is long before any MRIs with color contrast and all of that to look at people's heads. But the ancients knew how important it was to protect the head. You know, today we have um, helmets and hats for all kinds of things. You have a, hel a construction worker's helmet. You got a firefighter's helmet. You got a helmet for playing... Um, a uh, baseball, a batter's helmet. You've got a helmet for playing football that they're trying to develop more and more because they, they, they've recognized how dangerous it is to injure a head. You see, you can break an arm and they can reset it. You can break a leg and they can reset it. As a matter of fact, you can even lose your leg and they can give you a prosthetic. But the brain, is incredibly different. There are no brain transplants. And so we've come to recognize how important it is to protect the brain and the mind. And Paul says, put on this helmet of salvation. And this helmet of salvation is a renewed mind, a mind that is no longer under the domination of sin, yes, it can be affected by sin, which is an invisible force that emanates from the person of Satan, but it is no, the mind that is renewed in Christ is not under sin's domination anymore. I want to give you a definition also of eternal life. We talked about that sin is an invisible force, but know this too. That eternal life that comes from salvation, from wearing the helmet of salvation, is also an invisible force. Say that with me. Eternal life is an invisible force. Say it together. Eternal life is an invisible force. Let me finish the definition. In eternal life is an invisible force emanating from the person of Jesus. It impacts the mind of the Christian to stimulate the brain to think in thoughts and urges and fantasies and ideas in terms of life choices which enhance and develop 
one's divine potential. Again, Dr. Richard Dobbins. But Jesus said it this way. Here's what he said. He didn't use as many words. He just simply said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. I have come that your mind may be renewed, that you might experience my eternal life impacting your mind, stimulating your brain, thinking thoughts that will bring glory to God, that will enhance the divine potential that I have promised and destined for you. Oh, wear the helmet of salvation. And then he talks about not only put on this helmet of salvation and this armor, he talks about pick up the sword of the Spirit. Now, I read somewhere that every Roman soldier had a sword. And I want to tell you that every believer ought to have a sword too, right? You got your sword this morning? If you got a physical Bible, if you've got an electronic Bible, whatever kind of Bible, come on, hold it up. I want to see your sword this morning. Come on, lift it up. Lift it up. Yeah. yeah, it's in there, right? Don't keep it cheese. Get it out. I, I'll tell you, if you don't have a Bible, come see one of the staff. We're going to give you a Bible. You ought to have a sword if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. The sword of the Spirit, it clearly says in this text that it is the Word of God. Back to the Roman soldier. They, they had a sword, and it was called the gladius, and it was a double-edged blade approximately 12 to 20 inches long. It was designed for close combat. When the enemy was up in your face, up in your business, you had this gladius to defend yourself. Now, while the gladius wasn't the Roman soldier's only weapon, for the most part, it was the weapon of choice, especially in close combat. Using it effectively was a matter of life and death. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says to us, For the word of God is living and active, catch this, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. I want to tell you, even this past week, you know, um, I got aggravated with, with some people. And, and you know, I, I was just, you know, I was thinking thoughts that just weren't God, good godly thoughts. And God just convicted me. He went to the attitude of my heart. Why? Because the word of God came back and began to speak to me about what God says. Eternal life that em emanates from the person of Satan, that stimulates the brain to think. You know, we need to understand how important the word of God, this sword of the spirit, is for us. Think for a moment. When we examine... The spiritual battle that Jesus faced in the wilderness as Satan tempted him in three different areas. What in every one of those areas, Jesus responded with three words. Do you remember what those three words were? Yeah, say it again. It is written. Say that with me. It is written. What is written? The word of God is written. Jesus was, he had the sword of the Spirit for this close in contact and battle. When the enemy came against him personally, Jesus knew what the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, said. Can I tell you, when Satan uses his tactics, the sword of the Spirit, the Bible is your best weapon of choice. Read the Word of God. Commit the Word of God to memory. I mean, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to get the Word in you. Even if you don't, I know so many people say, I can't memorize it, you know, and I often say, you know what your address is, right? You know what your phone number is, right? You memorized it. 
You can memorize it. You just have to work at it. Commit the word of God. It is the sword of the spirit that helps us in close combat. Finally, God has provided us armament not only that we can stand against, but so that we can stand aggressively. Look at verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. That's pretty aggressive there. Always, all kinds of prayers, all the saints. There's this attitude of prayer. There is this praying in the Spirit, I believe, that's identified here. Praying in the Spirit. You know, the single most powerful prayers are those that are Spirit-led and directed prayers. I, I was like many people when the Gulf War happened, amazed at the new technology. These smart bombs, and I just recently learned that Texas Instruments, just right here in North Texas, took and made dumb bombs, smart bombs. There was this, if I remember the name of this thing right, they attached it to the front of these bombs, and it was called the, the pathway or something like that. And the way this thing worked, they attached it to the front of the, of the bomb, and then if somebody out there in the field, the covert forces, took a laser and lit up a building, put, marked it with this laser, that building, when that was dropped from these stealth fighters and bombers, all of a sudden it locked onto that beam, and it knew because that building was painted with that laser, that's the direction it needed to head. I want to tell you, long before that technology, God had laser-guided prayer. There's a lady by the name of Jenny. She tells a story that one cool Virginia evening when her daughter Kelly was about 12, they were driving to the dentist appointment in an unfamiliar part of town. The road they were on was a divided highway with two lanes going in either direction, and it was lined by cement curbs. And she wasn't speeding, she writes, but she was looking at the buildings trying to find a street number. And you know why? Because they didn't have GPS back then. Or maybe she didn't use GPS, but anyway. She was looking at the buildings trying to find the, the numbered building that they were headed to. As it was a place she'd never been before. She says in an instant she turned her gaze back to the road as she's been looking at these buildings. And as she looked back at the road, um, she all of a sudden realized that right square in front of them was a stopped vehicle that was disabled in, in her lane. And without looking, she just moved into the left lane, careened around that car, and careened back into the right lane. After dropping Kelly off at school, they were kind of shook over that. She dropped Kelly off at school, and she headed into work. And one of the people at work... Lindy said to her, Jenny, are you okay? Earlier today, I had this overwhelming, urgent sense to pray for you and Kelly. So I stopped what I was doing and interceded for you. God painted the picture of her prayers to be directed by the Spirit to pray for them. She told her the story and was grateful that they had, that, that uh, God had spared them from a severe accident, from at least an accident nonetheless, that heaven's power on earth in the unseen world affected the seen world. Praying in the Spirit. Now this scripture also talks about praying without ceasing. I want to point out to you that it says, On all occasions, all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Oh, there's so many types of prayers. Uh, an interesting study for you to do sometimes would be look at the different types of prayers that are in the Bible. If I remember correctly, I think there's about seven different types of prayers. 
But anyway, um, the Bible talks about that, that with this armament, we, we need to be a people of prayer, praying all kinds of prayers. In her classic book, The Hiding Place, Corey Tim Boone talks about one of the kinds of prayers. She tells about this incident that taught her the principle of praying prayers of thanksgiving in all things. It was during World War II, if you know the story of Tr- Corrie Tim Boone, her sister Betsy and the entire family had been harboring Jewish people in their home, so they were arrested, imprisoned at Ravensbrook Camp. Their barrack was extremely crowded, stuffed into every corner were people. But not only that, this barrack was infested with fleas. Now, if you've ever had a flea bite, just imagine an infestation of fleas that is there day and night. And the only way that these fleas are living is feasting on the blood of people. They were just absolutely awful. One morning, Betsy and Corey were reading in their tattered Bible from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the reminder to pray pray a prayer of thanksgiving in all things. Betsy said to Corey, Corey, we have got to give thanks for these barracks and even for these fleas. (laughs) Corey said, no way, I'm not going to thank God for the fleas. But Betsy was persuasive. They did thank God even for the fleas. And during the months that followed, they noticed something. They noticed that all of the other barracks around them were constantly being harassed, being invaded by the guards. And they found that their barracks was relatively free of any guard interference. They could do their Bible study. They could talk openly. They even prayed there. It was their only place of refuge. Several months later, they learned the truth that the guards never entered their barracks because of those blasted fleas. What are the fleas in your life right now? You can certainly whine and complain about those fleas. Whatever it is that's driving you crazy, that's what most of us do. But will you pray in the Spirit? Will you pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, being alert, And keep on praying. Bow your heads and your hearts with me, please. Father.